morning, everyone. Very welcome to worship today. And as always, it's our prayer that we know God's presence as we worship him together. You should have an announcement sheet with uh, details of what's going on. There are a couple of events today and then coming up in the future. So please make a note of all of that. Unfortunately, I am very sorry to report the death of Billy Mitchell, formerly of 10 Balfour Park, Port Ballantrae, and latterly resident in Madeleine Court, Port Stewart. Billy played a large part in the life of this church, served as an elder for nearly 40 years. So we extend our sympathy to his son, Don, daughter-in-law Maureen, grandsons Jason, Craig and Corey, and Billy's brothers Alec and Walter. And the funeral is here tomorrow at one o'clock. But we commend them to your prayers at this time. We meet here to worship God. The psalm, psalmist tells us, make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing glory to God's name, God's glorious name. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you, sing praises to your name. Open our ears to listen. Open our eyes to see your face. In this hour of worship, take away the busyness of the week and give it to you, our Heavenly Father. We sing together as we come to praise God the words of To God Be the Glory. <laughs> Thank you. 
our loving Father God, we come to you now with hearts full of love and thanksgiving. You are the most caring, forgiving Father, Abba as your Son Jesus called you. How privileged we are that we can talk freely and personally to you, the almighty creator of the whole world. We can be selfish, lazy and foolish sometimes, but when we ask for your forgiveness, you are quick to forgive us. You protect us and guard us and lovingly answer our prayers when we ask for guidance and protection. When we come to a crossroads or have important decisions to make, you take time to listen to us and help us to choose the right path. You listen to our voices when we pray for others. And your healing powers are still wonderful to behold. You know us so well. And you love to hear our voices as we open our hearts to you. You have often come to our rescue when we have strayed from your perfect ways, Father God. And we humbly and gratefully now give you thanks and adoration for your goodness. You have often given us strength when we were weak or weary, and we pray that we can be brave enough to share the truth of your power and your unfailing love with others. With your help, we can live lives worthy of you. We can say what you would say to help others or act generously and sincerely when we hear of people in need. We are humbled, Lord God, that you willingly take time to listen to us, sinful and misguided as we sometimes are. My gracious of you, our Father and Creator, to pay attention to us, to care what happens to us, to love us undeserving as we are. We bless you for sending your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to be a perfect example for us to follow. You sent him to live for us, to teach us, and to show us a perfect example of how to live our lives. Then, Father God, you asked him to give up his life for us by dying a cruel and humiliating death on the cross. But, Lord God, you raised him on the third day, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Your perfect plan was then to send us your Holy Spirit to live in us and through us. Thank you, Father. We love you. We trust you for every aspect of our lives. We bring our prayer confidently in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. I want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and reading verses 1 to 9. 1 Peter 2 verses 1 to 9. So we hear the word of God. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. 
Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We end there at verse 9. Now, boys and girls, I'm sure you can all see me here. I have a few things with me in the pulpit. I want you to have a look at them. And I want you to tell me what all these things have in common. So I have a scarf. I can wave it today because they actually won. <laughs> okay. What else can I have? I've got a tie. Okay. There's a scarf, a tie. I've got a really nice hat here. I watched the Queen's funeral and I thought how nice it would be to wear hat like that, do you think I could be good? <laughs> Somebody said I. <laughs> what else? Any idea what that might be? And my last thing is here on my finger. So, we have a scarf, a tie, a hat, a collar and a ring. What do you think those might all have in common? Any, any ideas? I'll take big ideas as well. So, oh, yes, Beth? I said you wear them. You wear them, yes, that is right. You do wear them. Why do you think of these particular items? Any, any ideas? Any big people? <laughs> yes, uh, Oren? White. Sorry, I can't hear. White. White, okay. Well, yes, some of them are white, that's, that's true too. Looking for a wee bit more. They should be belong to <laughs> Who said that? Who's the clever person? <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> yes. Yes, they all show a sense of belonging, don't they? So who are you cheering with this star? Oh, maybe you can't see it. Northern Ireland football team. So you're a, a member of their supporters club. If you wear this tie, where do you belong to? Valeriana School, absolutely. If you wear this lovely hat, I don't think I'll give it back. <laughs> Who do you belong to? And if you know, you belong to the Royal Irish Regiment. Is that right? Is that what you want to say on? Yeah. Good boy. <laughs> if you wear one of these, what do you belong to? You belong to a particular profession, don't you? You're a minister, yes. And if you wear a wedding ring, it means you belong to somebody else, doesn't it? You made a commitment on a special day that you would be linked to somebody else for the rest of your life. Now, just as we might belong to a football supporters club or a school or a regiment, we're told in the Bible that Christians also belong to God. Just read it in 1 Peter 2 there. In fact, Peter says once you didn't belong to God. Now, nobody likes to be left out, do they? You don't like to not belong. But God made the way possible to belong. God wanted us to follow him, which is why he sent Jesus to make it possible that we could belong to him. Do you know when you belong, you also have responsibilities, don't you? And I think if you belong to a supporters club, you have to support your team, don't you? And you support them even when they're doing badly or 
you should if you're a good supporter. And you know, in our churches, we have to support one another and build one another up and help one another. And we all have the same goal to bring glory to Jesus. Then we go to school to learn. And if we belong to Jesus, we want to learn more about him, which is why it's good to come to church. It's good to come to Sunday school. It's good to learn more and more about him. It's also good to work for him. I know lots of people think ministers don't work, but they do sometimes. And if we are servants of God, we belong to God, he wants us to work for him. What else? Yes, our army and our military personnel have one person they swear allegiance to, and that was the queen and is now the king. And you know, those of us who belong to God must just have allegiance to him. Nobody else, just to God. And then when we get married, we make a commitment until death us to part. We make a very long commitment that we will stick with the other person for better, for worse, and through all kinds of things. And again, when we belong to God, we belong to his church, we need to be committed and we meet, need to stick together and we need to push on and work together through the bad times as well as the good. So I hope you'll remember all of that. You're all very clever. Your answers were all very good. So thank you very much. And we're going to sing now, Seek first the kingdom of God. These are words of Jesus. To seek first God's kingdom and everything else will be added onto you as well.
through the book of Exodus. You'll be pleased to know I'm going to chapter 31. The preceding chapters had all the details about the tabernacle, down to the very curtain hooks and what they should be like. Then chapter 30 has a lot about the people, what they should be like. They should be a praying people. They should be a consecrated people. They should be a people who give. They were told they were the ones who were paying for it. Now we come to chapter 31 and see what we can learn from it. So let us again hear God's word. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Oholiab, son of a of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. The tent of meeting, the ark of the covenant law with the atonement cover on it, and all the other furnishings of the tent, the table and its articles, the pure gold, the lampstand and all its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, and also the woven garments, both the sacred garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons when they served as priests, and the anointing oil and fragrant incense for the holy place. They are to make them just as I commanded you. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death. Those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people. For six days work is to be done. The seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. We pray that God will add his blessing to both these readings of his word and to his name be glory and praise. We again join together in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we have so much to thank you for. Food to eat, clothes to wear, friends and families, and so much more that we often take for granted. We are aware that there are many in the world, in this country, and in countries far away, who do not enjoy these blessings. So we give thanks today for those who challenge poverty by their words and their actions. For all those who give of their time, money, and skills to bring relief to people whose lives are blighted by poverty, and people who have to make difficult choices about how to use the scarce resources they have. We thank you that there are people 
who are prepared to speak out, to hold politicians and large companies to account, and who are prepared to put their faith into action by showing your love. Help us as we give thanks for the blessings we enjoy and to do what we are able to show your love to those in need. We give thanks for food banks that provide for those in need and for those who generously donate and volunteer their time to help them. We are grateful our children can go to school and be fully kitted out in uniforms and new things. We know that there are some children who don't have these things. But there are people who run uniform banks and we give thanks for them working tirelessly, collecting and sharing these items and making sure that all children are provided with what they need. We think about the homeless in our cities and pray that you protect them and help them each day. And we give thanks for the various groups who provide meals and clothes for them. Lord, we pray for those all around the world who are in poverty. May you guide those who support them. We give thanks for those we support in Christian Aid, in Tear Fund and many more, and make us generous people. As we pray for those without money or food, we remember those who are starved of love and companionship, who feel so alone in life. We remember the sick, the bereaved, praying for comfort for them, praying for the family in our own church who are in grief. We do not forget our royal family as the fuss is over, but still they grieve. Lord, thank you for all you do for us all. And it is in your name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn, we haven't sung for a while, I didn't admit that to you. <laughs> Uh, Sarah, but I think we managed to get through it okay. It's a lovely, a lovely song. It comes from the Psalms, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Will you hear it?
I die for you. I was talking to a man who is a civil servant. He works for the job market. Recently he took job fairs out around several towns and cities in the province. He said, I had 1,000 jobs on offer. Then he said, but nobody wants to work anymore. I was then talking to a painter and decorator and he said, I now have to strip all rooms myself. I have to fill in all cracks myself. I have to sand everything. Painters nowadays will just paint. And he used exactly the same words. He said, nobody wants to work anymore. <coughs> now, I know some of you have found this to be true too. You cannot employ anybody legally as they would lose their benefits and it, they would lose money by working. And I'm sure we all agree there's something wrong with such <clears throat> a system. Our research study has shown that 50% of people in the United Kingdom are in jobs not suited to their abilities or in jobs they hate, 50%. This is maybe why other research shows that Monday mornings are the most dreaded morning of the week. But scripture tells us that God created us to work, to find fulfillment in work, to find purpose in our work. There's dignity and there's self-respect in work that many people will actually never discover. If we go right back to the book of Genesis, where God created Adam, in chapter 1, verse 28, it says, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and over every other living creature that moves. Then in chapter 2, 15, it says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, to work it and to keep it. Now these jobs were given to Adam before the fall. So work was not a curse. Work was a blessing from God. Blessing that God gave to man. And even when God gave the commandments, he included the command to work. Six days you shall work. But the seventh is a Sabbath of holy rest to the Lord. But the other six days you would work. Then there was the penalty of death for anybody who would work on the Sabbath. God has made work a way in which we find purpose in life. A sense of accomplishment as he provides for us through our work. In the New Testament, Ephesians 4.28, Paul says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labour, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You'll know he didn't say, so that he can pile up more and more for himself, but so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. 2 Thessalonians, Paul is even stronger. He says, if a man will not work, let him not eat. And you know, even when God provided the manna in the wilderness to the Israelites, they still had to go out and collect it for themselves. And now we come to this passage in Exodus 31. And God is finishing up his meeting with Moses up there on the mountain. He's given Moses all the commandments, all the detailed instructions in building the tabernacle and in instituting the priesthoods. He also gave instructions on how the project was to be financed. 
But at the end of the day, it was a huge job. It was going to require the knowledge and skills of working with gold and silver and brass, making curtains, sewing the images into the material, making the priestly garments. It wasn't just an enormous task, it was a very skilled, detailed job. Now, out of all those people in the wilderness, Moses was the only one who would have had formal training or education of any kind. The rest had been slaves making bricks. So the task set before them now, here in chapter 31, is too great for one man alone. So God tells Moses that he is called Bazala and filled him with knowledge and ability and the Spirit of God so that he could make artistic designs and to work in gold and silver and bronze and to cut stones. God gave him directly those gifts and the Spirit of God. He says he has also appointed Aholiab and gave other men ability to do this work. God called them and he equipped them for the work he called them to. And he gave them the skills they needed. I'm sure one of the reasons so many people dread Monday morning is because they're not doing what God has called them to do. And there's a big mistake that many Christians make. They think a calling of God is to do something within the church. You're called to preach or teach or pastor, but they separate their secular and their spiritual life when in effect they are the same thing. And God called Bezalel and Aholion to the work of constructing the tabernacle and the furnishings that were to be part of the worship of God. And he called those men to do those practical tasks in the same way as he called Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, the same way he called Jeremiah to be a prophet, the same way he called Paul to be an apostle. God really does have a plan and a call for our life, each individual here. He has a purpose ordained by him for each one of his children. The New Testament is full of it. Ephesians 4.11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. First Corinthians, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. Varieties of activities, varieties of service, but it's the same God who empowers them all in every one. There are a variety of jobs that need to be done. And God calls different people to do these jobs. He doesn't call people only to full-time Christian ministry or missionary work. There are lots of callings. There are lots of jobs to be done for the upbuilding of God's people. When God called Jeremiah to be a prophet, he said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God called Moses to lead the people of Israel. He called Paul to preach about Jesus. And here today in this passage we're looking at, he calls Bezalel to build the tabernacle and he calls Aaron to be a priest. Different callings, but the same Lord and all working for the same purpose. Let me ask you, do you know what 
your calling is? Do you feel you have fulfilled what God has called you to do? Remember the late Robert McIver telling me how he ended up in the bank? He said, I left school, my father told me in an interview, and then I was told I started on Monday. And he said, as only Robert could, in those days you did what your dad told you. <laughs> And isn't that so true? And many people end up farming because they inherit the farm. Many people end up in a family business. But that could most definitely be their calling in life. Very often your calling and your passion or your interests are the same. Moses had a passion for the Hebrew people. He wanted them out of Egypt. He began by going about it the wrong way. He, he did it his way and it all ended in a disaster. But eventually God called him from the burning bush. And this time he did it God's way, in God's time. But it was something Moses really wanted to do. People can miss their calling in life. Do you know it's more terrible to reject your calling in life. God calls you, makes it clear, you should do it. Very easy to be lured by money, or glamour, or status, without thinking, is this the right thing for me to do? Many a person has ended up wealthy, and at the top of their business or the top of their profession, maybe owning thousands of acres, but totally unfulfilled. And worse, losing their own souls. Jesus said those ominous words, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul? Many of you, like me, are near the end of your life than in the beginning. And one thing we learn is that all of life's achievements at the end of the day come to nothing. The little adage is true, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. And that is so true. When you sit down to organise a funeral, no matter what the person's achievements are, they're summed up in a few words and then forgotten by most. God allowed Bezalel to be born and to be one behind the building of his detailed and intricate house in the wilderness. I'm sure he could great satisfaction in doing that job but God doesn't just call he equips and the equipping comes from the Spirit of God God said I have filled him with the Spirit of God Paul realized his equipping came from God in Philippians he wrote I know how to be brought low and I know how to abide in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then he says those wonderful words, I can do all things. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If God calls you, he'll give you all you need through his spirit. I know many of you sitting here this morning are older and you think, oh great, this is not for me, but I'm sorry. There's no retirement in the army of God. At the minute, I'm recruiting people in their 70s to cook burgers on a Friday night. And you know, you could do that too. It's not a hard thing to do. It's maybe not a pleasant thing to do. 
but it's a form of service that anybody could do. And these people are not young. And the last people who did it were not young. There are plenty of things you can still be doing even if you're old. And let me tell you, if you are actually totally done out, you can still pray. Because absolutely nothing will be achieved without prayer. Nothing. So what is God calling you to do? Yes, you. You know, there are those who sit in churches and um, you know, they like to criticise and they like to tear down rather than build up. They're, they like it when things go wrong. They're not here to build up. About you, every time you seek to mock or complain your own church, do you ever think, what could I do to help those people who are working? Can I pray about this? How do I encourage those who are working? You know, a people united, working for God, are a powerful people. Powerful if they're working in the Spirit of God, backed up by prayer. The second half of this chapter reminds us of something else that I just want to say in closing. The opposite of not wanting to work is working too much and forgetting who we work for. We can be so caught up in God's work that we miss God. And service of God should be the result of a relationship with God. It should be the result of working with us, co-workers with God. So that is why God gave the one day and seven to sit back and enjoy him and enjoy fellowship with him and then go out the rest of the week to work for him. Those two men, I can hardly pronounce their names, they were ordinary men called to do a massive task equipped by their caller. Whatever God calls you to do, he will make you able to do it. Do not doubt that. You doubt yourself. We all do. Don't doubt what God can do through you. Let us pray. God our Father, most of us feel inadequate about many things, but save us from doubting you and doubting what you can do in us. None of us wants to be proud or boastful, but we do want to be able to boast in what God has done. So we pray that you'll make all of us here in this building this morning workers not spectators, but workers, to build up your church and to enthrone you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as if all that wasn't bad enough, we're going to say here the call of the king. Listen out. <laughs>
whisper, be with us all evermore. Amen.